Uh, another startup uh, called Google, uh, the jury's out. We'll see, they have some sort of a search function that they're trying to, to compete against uh, with Yahoo, I think. Uh, we're gonna see what they do. Um, I'm a big fan of Google. I think they're gonna make it. I don't think they're gonna right. We have Ashley Scorpio from Hawk Media that's going to be uh, involved. I think she's gonna be hosting this. And Yoav Bergman, who's a great guy. I've gotten to know him over the years working at Hawk. Uh, and Gary Power, a genius Google savant. I think he went to Havid also, smart guy. Um, you're gonna be spitting some mad knowledge about uh, what you can do with Google over the next couple of months and probably in addition to the next couple of months, which we're all super fired up about uh, anytime. So there'll be lots of good information about that. But before they get into it, we have a special giveaway. The early bird gets the worm. Who's ready for today's giveaway? I bet you are. I know I am. We have a winner. And this winner, I found out, is ready, Danica Garcia. She happens to also be a famous race car driver. No, I'm kidding. That's not. That's Danica Patrick. I know it's not Danica Patrick. All right, it's Danica. I thought it'd be funny. So if you laughed, cool. If you didn't laugh, and you said, "Wait a minute, that's not who the race driver is," then you don't have a sense of humor. All right. So congratulations, Danica. This is awesome. Um, you know what you got? you got something from another company that's pretty cool, FabFitFun. You're gonna get a free box from them and you know they have lots of goodies. So you should be super stoked about that. And for the rest of the presentations that we have coming up uh, today, October 1st, you guys ready for Halloween? I hope so. What do you think some of the more popular costumes are gonna be? Hmm, I wonder. There's a, I wonder if there's like an official COVID costume if that's floating around. And I don't know if that would even be in bad taste because you know, it's still kind of a weird thing. It might be too soon, maybe 2021 or 2022. But anyways, without further ado, I would like to welcome Ashley Scorpio and the gang. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Scott. <laughs> um, as Scott mentioned, I'm the VP of Partnerships here with Hawk Media, and I'll be your Hawk host on this call today with our partners at Google. Um, like Scott said, we have our colleagues, uh, Yoav and Gary. So Yoav is actually a former management consultant in UCLA MBA. He started and sold his own agency before going on over to Google. He's also a new father, one of the coolest dads I know, um, an avid tennis player, a uh, golfer, taco aficionado, and yogi. So lots of lifestyle balance there, which I can appreciate. And then we've got Gary. And Gary is an Englishman, Irishman, and American who might either sound South African or Australian, depending on your opinion. Um, he's been at Google just helping companies grow over the past two years and established a startup called Vue. I think is the house pronounced, although I'm sure Gary can put a better spin on it in his assets. Um, in the professional sports space before going over to Google. So he loves uh, what Brits would call football, which you know we would call soccer, and is a diehard Liverpool fan. So we've got a really multicultural and diverse panel here for you today. I might not sound like it, but I'm actually from Canada myself and have lived in three different countries as well. So hopefully we can bring some great interactive insights to all of you today on Google and search marketing um, and that offering for you. So yeah, without further ado, Yoav, would you like to tell everyone a little bit about your role day to day at Google and how you work with agencies that talk to you? Yeah, for sure. And Ashley, thank you. Uh, and Scott, thank you for that introduction. Man, so much energy. I love it. Um, so I'm an agency development manager. So I've been at Google for a little over two years. And so I work with agencies to help them grow. So whether it means growing their existing business, acquiring new business, thinking through kind of where they are today and where the world is going to be in five years and kind of helping them position um, themselves to accelerate that growth. Awesome. Uh, same to you, Gary. Can you tell everyone a little bit more, not just about yourself, but about your role at Google specifically and how you support the agencies and work? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the intro. And uh, Scott got a few laughs out of me. Really appreciated that. 
Uh, my role is uh, really on the day-to-day -day agency account manager role. So what that really means is that I'm working with uh, your kind of media buyers, uh, with kind of your tactical strategists, uh, really working with our joint clients and, and really helping them understand, you know, one, how to really optimize on a day-to-day -day basis and how to meet their business goals as well through their media channels. So really helping grow our collective partners and clients together um, through kind of optimization and, and tactics. Awesome. Well, thank you both for coming here today. Um, Yoav, it's been a really crazy year. Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> this is probably the understatement of the year, honestly. And there's obviously been a lot of shifts in consumer behavior and retail trends. And Google does a really great job tracking all of that. And there is a great place to find those different Google retail trends online. Can you tell us a little bit about the biggest shift that you've seen this year? Yeah, so I think that's spot on, right? When we think about it, COVID has really just accelerated a lot of trends that are already happening. So whether it's the move from TV to OTT, from online to omnichannel, from sitting in traditional media offices for an hour to wait to get called up, right, to telemedicine. Like, I think we're seeing a fundamental shift in a lot of industries. And so whether it's traditional retailers, you know, brick and mortar stores um, who were holding on to kind of the in-store experience and you're seeing a rapid shutdown, you know, maybe a decade's worth in six months, um, you know, all across the board, I think we're seeing kind of a, a rapid um, acceleration in really trends that were already happening. And a lot of that is exciting, right? Like a lot of it is really terrible, um, but there's also opportunity there. And so being able to kind of understand where different businesses are and how they can take advantage of the new world, um, I think is really interesting. I, I was listening to um, Olivia's kind of talk right before this, and we have the same presentation, right? Like the data is the data. The question is just what do brands do and how do they adjust? Definitely. And on that note, Gary, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, there might be some merchants here today that actually haven't made a foray into paid search yet. Can you talk a little bit about what some key stable table stakes are when you're sort of setting up your campaigns as a merchant on across Google's um, products and services? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, Google does have a few different products. You know, obviously we think of Google as the search channel and I think we definitely want to be thinking first and foremost about search. I mean, search is such a powerful tool, right? Being there in that moment, right? When someone's looking for something that you have to offer, it's, it's somewhere you really want to be. Uh, so I think, you know, first and foremost, we really want to think about search and, you know, working with the whole media team, you know, they're really, really good about, kind of having a really smart approach with search. I think, for example, one thing I really like that Hawk Media does is they're always mining for new new keywords and, and new ways that people are finding, uh, kind of ways that people are finding their products. So, you know, having kind of a way to always experiment with keywords, have kind of a set of keywords that you utilize, but also always be willing to try and find new ones. I think one stat that always amazes me is that you know, 15 to 20% of searches every single day have never been seen before. And so what that means is that you have to be able to adapt and evolve and, you know, cater to the fact that people are searching different ways uh, now than they were a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. So I think on the search side, it's really about being there, right? First and foremost, you want to be there. It's, you know, search has such great intent. Uh, but then also just being able to adapt and evolve and, and being willing to be open-minded about finding new ways that people are searching for your products. I think something that I think is really powerful these days and only becoming really more and more powerful for Google is really on the shopping side, right? So when I think about Q4, I think about e-commerce a lot. I think shopping is going to be a huge, uh, huge component for a lot of advertisers and a lot of companies. And when we think about what is Google shopping first and foremost, it's really when you go search on Google, we got that little shopping tab that you hit. You hit that tab and you can see a comparison of different products. They're always going to have different prices. You could see 
and kind of browse, you know, different products and kind of decide what you want to see. But, you know, Google made a big change about six months ago that opened up Google shopping to all merchants free and paid. And so what that means now is that if you go to Google shopping for something, you're more likely to see a much greater variety of products and services and, and businesses and products that they offer. And so what that means is that for an advertiser, there's a lot more people finishing their shopping on Google shopping now than they were before. So we definitely want to have a shopping presence. We want to be aware of that. And then I would say the last component really for Google that you really want to think about is the video component. I think video is becoming a, a more and more powerful way for businesses to reach their, their audience, to deliver, deliver a message that is really powerful. And, you know, Google has, you know, the largest video platform in the world and YouTube, you know, the second largest search engine behind Google. And so I think, you know, it's a really powerful platform to, you know, get creative, deliver a really good message, reach a lot of people for not that expensive way. So, yeah, I would say those are really the three main components. Search, you want to be there. There's such great intent. People are looking for what you have to offer, you know, be there, show up. Shopping, take advantage of some of the changes, you know, we've had. And, and then on the video side, you know, this is really your opportunity to build your brand, get creative and, and deliver that message in a cost effective way to a lot of people. Awesome. Mr. Charles, can you dig in a little more? Can you tell us about what some of the best practices are when it comes to Google Shopping, maybe touching on the Merchant Center more broadly and promotions? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Merchant Center is really feeds into the shopping, right? So Merchant Center is where you put up your products and, you know, then based on that, they become available both in free listings and sponsored listings. And so what it also determines the Merchant Center feed is the types of searches that you're showing off on. So dependent on how you describe the product, how descriptive you are, if you're selling red shoes, you know, we want to show up on red shoes, right? We got to think about the whole advertising ecosystem for Google is based on relevancy, right? So we want to be very descriptive in how we set up the Merchant Center feed. We want to make sure that we don't have any issues. You know, sometimes there can be kind of little problems that can develop into suspension. So I would say really important Merchant Center health is super important because that kind of feeds into everything. I would say for the best practices, you know, I think something that we've seen a really powerful uptick is smart shopping, right? So smart shopping is really using the greatest automation and it, it, it places shopping ads across shopping, Google search, a little bit of display and, and YouTube as well. It's something that we've seen has been really, really powerful. And I think it really leverages the best in automation to find the right person at the right time. I would say that, um, you know, kind of thinking about how do you really optimize this? It really does come down to merchant center feed. It does come down to kind of quality of the creative a little bit as well. Um, and also how you set targets, right? So um, I think one thing that is really kind of the importance of it gets lost sometimes is that some people think a goal is a really high ROAS, but oftentimes, almost all the time, a goal is really revenue or revenue growth. And oftentimes there's this trade-off between volume and efficiency that sometimes can be overlooked. And so if you just go for efficiency, you're gonna miss out a lot on volume. So I think what that means as a practitioner, as someone who's trying to figure out what's best for my business is what is that trade-off we wanna make? You know, uh, how should we set our targets? What should our ROAS targets be? What should it be maybe for one category versus another? And we do actually have some pretty powerful tools one of them being our performance planner, which actually helps companies understand looking at projections. Well, if I had a ROAS of five, what kind of revenue would I bring in? Versus if I looked at a ROAS of three or four, you know, could that revenue be much, much higher? And what is that trade off? So hopefully that helps a little bit with on the shopping side. I think so. Um, are there, and maybe you have, you can jump in here too. Are there any obvious pitfalls for a new brand um, that's, perhaps not a new brand, but that's new to Google that they can avoid across the entire suite? Um, there's all, I mean, I would say that there's always different things that you can think about. I think first off, like trying to figure out like who is your, your target audience and how are you going to go after these people? I think you have to have a sense for that before you start any type of advertising, right? Um, we don't want to go in totally blind. 
Um, but then I would say after that, we really, we want to leverage automation. We want to leverage expertise and we want to leverage the combination of human intelligence and machine intelligence, right? We can't just depend on one or the other. We can't just set and forget it and say a machine is going to figure out everything for us. We also can't rely on a human to be able to make a thousand changes, you know, every millisecond like a machine does. But, you know, what we need to combine is the, the human intelligence with the machine intelligence. Maybe, you know, a human can better understand business cycles. Maybe it can better understand inventory challenges, profit margins for different products. And so how we set up a Google account is dependent on a lot of these things. And so I think not being too reliant on just machines and not being too reliant on humans, really using the combination intelligence from both. Uh, to be able to set up the account appropriately, I think it's the best strategy. And kind of adding to that, you know, I think it's all about being there and being relevant, right? So whether that's on Google, on Facebook, on search, on video, on Instagram, um, it doesn't really matter. It's important that, you know, brands are there where their consumers are and that they're leveraging insights from one platform to feed another creating audience lists, retargeting them across platforms and really just thinking about the customer journey, right? Like people get in the car, they go on YouTube, then they hop on Instagram, then they go on Google Maps, then they go on Amazon. Brands, I think, that are able to bridge the insights across all of those platforms are the ones that end up succeeding. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so for anyone who's listening, who's not working with a Hawk Media or another agency to kind of get that human layer of expertise and intelligence, there are a lot of great resources that Google has online for free, whether it's the Analytics Academy or the Ads Academy, there's Google Scholar, there's the Skill Shop. Um, so, you know, if you're looking to sharpen your digital marketing chops and learn more about search and paid search and all of Google's products and services in video, like YouTube, um, those are all great resources that, you know, any of the merchants on the line today should think about looking more into. There's also certifications. So that's often um, really in-depth and a lot of fun if you're into digital marketing. Um, but yeah, I have a more broad question for people uh, listening here when they're thinking about structuring your marketing budget. Is there a general ballpark that they should be setting aside of their entire marketing budget specifically for search and for paid search? I mean, I, that's a great question, right? I mean, I think what I, I would flip it a little bit and say that how a company, if I was owning a business, I was thinking about my marketing, I'll be thinking about how profitable is my marketing spend, right? And I think if my, if my spending is profitable and I'm making more money putting in and getting out than I am putting in, then I should spend more, right? So I think, um, yeah, and this does apply to all channels and, and there's definitely some, you know, intelligence and knowledge that goes into actually figuring out what is a return on ad spend? How do we understand kind of attribution across channels can be a little bit of challenge. But I would say, look, if you if you are making more money than you're putting in, why not spend more? You know, so I think, you know, what's really important is figuring out, you know, what is, for example, a break even return on ad spends? You know, what, what are our profit margins and, and what is the minimum we need to make where as long as we're making more than that, we're making money. And if we, if we make less than that, then we lose money. I would never tell a company that's losing a ton of money that they should just keep spending more unless they're, you know, an Amazon or a Netflix where they're really just kind of trying to own the market and they don't really care about losses. That's not usually the case. Usually it's more about trying to figure out, are we making money? And if we are making money, like let, let's double down. You know, I think sometimes it can be challenging for, early stage startups, you know, maybe companies a little bit more early stage startup than Google, you know, where they, they have maybe, maybe some cash flow challenges, maybe some inventory challenges. Um, you know, these companies, you know, they, they can't, they have to be a little bit more careful, right? And so maybe they have some parameters where maybe they say, hey, we don't want to spend more than say 20 to 30% of our revenue on marketing in general. And then we try and figure out which channels are working the best. Right. So I think it is dependent on the situation, but I would say I would try and figure out like, are you profitable? If you are profitable, 
why not spend more? And I think that does apply for a lot of different channels. And I think it's a good way of thinking about it. And, and Ashley, if, if I could jump in quickly, I think making money is, is broad, right? So it's like, overall, are they making money? Yes, no. But also some companies might be making a lot of money on certain products or certain product lines, right? So if we think of an e-commerce company that has some private label and also sells, you know, um, other companies' goods, maybe the private label products, they're making a lot of money on that. And so understanding how they really think about that, right? Um, maybe there, maybe some customers are extremely profitable, right? Maybe you look at the customer lifetime value and there's certain customers that come back over and over again and being able to kind of focus the search and focus um, your strategies and your creative to really target those specific audiences and sell the specific products where you're making the most money, um, you know, I think leads to overall profitability. And I've seen Gary work with, um, specifically with Hawk, really on, you know, like breaking that down and saying, all right, across the board, like what is the customer lifetime value of these different audiences? How are we thinking about targeting them? And it's not all about Google. It's not all about Facebook. It's not about Amazon, or TikTok. It's really about the audience in being there where the audience is, um, you know, and having the right message and the right creative that kind of resonates with them at the time when they're on that given platform. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think determining and understanding the lifetime value of your customer and going after that most lucrative segment of your audience um, cannot be overlooked. It should definitely be a key part of marketing strategy for any merchant. Um, yeah, but beyond um, lifetime value, if we're getting back to the basics for a minute, um, a lot of merchants, again, who are new to search advertising might not know where they start. And can you talk a little bit more about the interplay between organic search and SEO practices and how, how important is that and how can that affect your paid search ad performance? Sure. So, I mean, they're definitely, they're definitely separate, you know, organic and SEO, but there is to your point, there's some interchangeability. I would say if you, if you're first starting on search, one of the most important things companies think about is what is our brand presence online? What is our digital presence? Right. And so one of the most important ways you can control your digital presence is if someone searches for your brand name, can you be at the top? Right. And I think some companies think that, a lot of people just type in a brand name and, and that's it. And they should always show up first organically. I think in reality is how people search is it's usually variations of a business name, right? It might be your business versus another, maybe your business. What are the reviews of this business? You know, what are people saying about this business? Like what are, what is people's recent experience? You know, there are a lot of different ways that people search for a business name. So I think starting there and saying, Hey, when people search, any variation of our business. We want to control the messaging that we show to them. We want to control what landing page they go to. We want to make sure that if they're buying a product that instead of organically, it takes them five clicks to get there. We put an ad up and they're one click away from a purchase. I think even just thinking about the optimization of that is a really big deal because you know most companies they look at what's my conversion rate on you know, organic versus paid and the paid is much, much higher because we can control a lot more things. I think an example I always like to give a company that's doing really well digitally these days is Nike, right? If you type in Nike red shoes or Nike anything, you're going to see an ad for Nike. Now it's not because Nike doesn't necessarily think that you're going to go to Nike's homepage, but they want to show you the, the deals that they have right now. They want to take you to specific landing pages. When you search for a product, they want you to take you directly to that product page, not to a home page where then you have to spend time finding it. And then next thing you know, you left the page so you can find the product, right? So I'd say first and foremost, yeah, a lot of on the search side, thinking about your brand and, and that digital presence is really important. And then I would say also on the search side that, I work collectively with Hawk and we, we set up a lot of this is dynamic search is a really powerful thing for Google. 
And so what this really is, is if we think about what the core of Google is, right? What, if we think about organic search, what Google is really doing is matching relevant searches with relevant businesses and products. And so dynamic search is really taking that same technology and applying it to paid advertising and saying, how can we understand crawler website, understand the content, and then know when someone's searching a keyword, we know that that's relevant to your business. And we can leverage dynamic search to automatically show up for keywords that are relevant to your business. So I would say if you're a new advertiser, you're coming into Google for the first time, you're thinking, where do I even start? Let's maybe start with like, let's controlling your, your business, your digital image. Let's control your business name, but also variations of your business name. And someone's looking for reviews, like let's show up first, let's control the messaging. And then let's use dynamic search to really mine for new keywords, find new customers uh, and go out and leverage the machine learning technology to help you find those new, new keywords. And then what you can do over, over time is you can just kind of build up and develop new campaigns around those keywords that you find in dynamic search. So that's, I would say, two things to think about on the search side when you're first starting. Great, so to recap for everyone, your branded keywords are extremely important, including variations on your name, as well as those dynamic ads. And something else that you mentioned just briefly um, were Google customer reviews. Um, perhaps can you talk a little bit more about Google customer reviews, product ratings, and the importance of those in particular for e-commerce brands? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about anytime you try and buy a product or you use a service or anything, what, what is one of the first things you do? You probably look at reviews, right? I mean, I know I do, you know, if I'm trying to buy something, I want to know what do other people feel about it? You know, is this going to be shipped to me on time? You know, is, is this going to be something where it shows up and, you know, it's not going to be damaged? Is it, is it, does it last for a long time? I mean, all these questions that you have about a product or a service, you can answer before you even put your money down by looking at reviews, right? And so if you're a business, especially if you've got good reviews, like show it off, right? We want, we want to show off that we have high reviews. We know customers care about it. We know it's a strong signal. So if we have strong reviews, uh, we should show it off on the search side. We can use extensions to show it. You know, same thing on the shopping side. You know, we can use kind of different uh, tools to kind of highlight that. So yeah, I would say, I mean, it's super important. It's almost intuitive how important it is. But to your point, sometimes it's overlooked. Sometimes it's not really thought about that we can really incorporate this into the paid advertising side, but it's super important. Totally. Now that we've sort of covered a bit of the basics to give everyone a baseline of, you know, how much budget they should be spending, a, setting aside, what specific products they should be looking at, where they should start and get set up and learn, I think we should talk a little bit more about specifically holiday prep, because that's what we're here today to discuss. So, Yoav, I know we already talked a little bit about how COVID-19 and the pandemic has changed consumer behavior and online purchasing behavior this year. And we've seen many different shifts and a lot of people heard about it perhaps for the first time, what some people are calling boy piss in our last session or um, buy online pick up in store for anyone who might not be familiar with yeah. um, Can you talk to us, you'll have a little bit more about this trend and how e-tailers um, can either partner with brick and mortar and take advantage of it or how brick and mortar can make this option available and sort of make that shift from offline to online. <laughs> yeah, it, apologies, she was screaming, screaming my name. So she's here to join for this conversation. Um, so yeah, it, it's really interesting, right? If we look at, you know, online sales accounted for 40% of Black Friday sales last year, that number is undoubtedly going to be much, much, much higher. Um, 70% of mobile shoppers plan to use their smartphone to actually make a purchase. And so retailers need to understand that it, it's not enough to, to have online sales. They need to have an online strategy that complements that. So, and they need to market, they need to market that, right? They need to market their delivery, um, the convenience, whether it's same day delivery, curbside pickup. Um, we talked about some of the trends that consumers are really looking for. 
Um, and those are the same things that brands need to highlight, um, you know, in kind of understanding and getting in front of some of those expectations. Post visit. So someone came to your store, they visited, like, what can you do to make that experience amazing for the consumer? So how can you thank them? How can you retarget them? Um, how can you show them? I, I know Olivia's last presentation talked about, you know, being more than just products. You're more than just delivering products to a person. And so how can you show off, like, who are you as a brand? Um, what do you stand for? What do you care about? Um, and, you know, that also allows you to have a much deeper connection with, with your consumers. Sure. That's great. And speaking of connections, do you want to introduce us to our newest panelist here? I think yeah. you guys call them Nooglers when they're new to Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, this is Stella Marie Bergman. Uh, she recently learned to walk and scream. And she, oh. so she's running around the house yelling, Abba, Ooh. Abba, which means dad. Either, so. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Stella, for joining us. Um, speaking of new, uh, are there any new Google ad products that business owners and merchants should be aware of that they should be thinking about leveraging and adding to their marketing mix? I would say, you know, uh, there's, there's always a lot of innovation. There's always a lot of uh, new products coming out. Um, I would say, you know, certainly on the YouTube side, we're always developing kind of new different types of formats, you know, kind of more ways to make YouTube response, uh, more direct response, right? Um, I would say, you know, one thing that I that I think is pretty interesting that I, I've seen kind of starting to work pretty well is image extensions on the search side, right? So search advertising has traditionally been very text heavy. And so, you know, if you see in my background here, I got a few plants. These are actually from one of our joint clients, the SIL. Uh, and you know, these, uh, we recently started using image extension with the sill. You imagine you're, you're buying a plant. I want to see what it looks like, right? And I think that's, that's true with a lot of other products. And so I think uh, what we can expect to see is, you know, bringing images a little bit more into search. How can we make search a little bit more dynamic and interactive as opposed to just the tech side? So I think that's something that I've recently seen work pretty well that I'm, I'm pretty excited to see come to other clients and, and also see a little bit more imagery come brought to the search side. I think that's something we'll probably see moving forward. Awesome. Um, so what a lot of merchants might know that don't have a background in marketing is that oftentimes search users are in market and much more qualified potential buyers or consumers. And if you think about it logically, that makes a lot of sense because a social media user, they're just going about their day. They're just scrolling through their feed. They're not specifically looking for a product, a service, or a business. Whereas a search user is literally opening up a search window to find something. So they're probably primed to purchase. They're ready to um, make a move there. And either they're looking for those reviews that Gary mentioned. Um, they're maybe looking for feedback images, maybe they're looking through shopping and the carousel and the imagery there. Um, and so oftentimes a lot of people think about Google as a very bottom funnel initiative at the sort of conversion stage. But there are a number of other ways to leverage Google's products, um, such as YouTube and video for more top of funnel initiatives. Can you talk a little bit more about great ways to leverage YouTube um, in particular in the lead up to Black Friday and Cyber Monday? Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, happy. I'm, I... Go ahead, Yov. Yeah. Um, so if you think about, about YouTube, right, it's the second biggest search engine in the world. And people go to YouTube for a number of reasons, whether it's to learn a new skill, to watch highlights from the Laker game, to um, I remember I was the best man at my buddy's wedding and we didn't know how to tie a bow tie like during morning of the wedding. And it's just like, you go to YouTube and you, you know, you, you can pick up a skill. Um, so there are so many reasons people go to YouTube and you have an ability to target people along the funnel, leveraging the insights that you have from search, leveraging the insights that you have from Gmail, from maps. Um, 
et cetera, right? And so when, when we talked initially about kind of the, the shift from TV to OTT, from traditional TV where you're just kind of putting your message out there um, and seeing what sticks, but you don't really have the ability to target, YouTube allows you to do that. And so today we're, a lot, we're able to target consumers on the TV screen um, whether it's through YouTube TV or just through YouTube and you target the TV. And we've seen that explode over COVID and that is not changing at all. Um, and so if you think about it, it's a very similar strategy as what TV used to be where you're able to reach billions of users at once at the same time, whether it's through linear programming or scheduled programming but you can also target. So you can target different regions, different households, different demographics. Um, and now where you weren't able to before, really understand, did those households, did those specific people convert? If they converted, what was the messaging? You can A, B test different things. And so I think we're seeing uh, you know, real innovation from a number of different brands in how they're testing different strategies. Um, you know across the board, whether it's search display YouTube and more specifically how they're using insights from those top funnel, right? And kind of pushing consumers down the funnel um, with different messaging and different strategies. Now there's- yeah, obviously... I think that's- Sorry, and maybe Gary, you can, you can jump in here. Tell us more yeah. about- different ad units within YouTube. Some are skippable, some aren't. What is the value proposition there? If you can touch on that and whatever else you were going to say. Yeah, absolutely. What, what I was just going to add to your first point is I think it's interesting. A lot of businesses and advertisers do sometimes think about Google as a lower funnel. But well, I actually recently read a study two days ago that showed that more people start their search for a product or a service on Google than any other place. Right. And so, you know, even if we think about e-commerce, right, you might, for example, end up buying something on Amazon, but you might actually start on Google search to try and do the research and try and figure out what is available, what are the different products, what are reviews. And then, you know, if you end on Amazon, you buy an Amazon, we're going to probably miss out that attribution. So I think there's actually a lot going on on the search side that actually helps drive a lot of upper funnel stuff as well that people don't realize on YouTube for sure. I mean, I think YouTube, I think is, uh, you know, to your point, there's a lot of new, new ads and, and types of formats. I think uh, one of the recent ones I think is very uh, prevalent right now is maximize reach, right? So we have a type of format that literally the goal is to reach as many people as possible, as many new people as possible. So we have other types of formats where the goal might be to drive a conversion or an online sale or a form fill out. And so, you know, even just kind of the type of strategy that we use can determine, you know, how we actually serve the inventory, how we serve different types of formats. In terms of the typical formats that are used, 15 and 30 seconds are the most, uh, I would say effective, but six seconds, little bumper ads, the ones where you're almost forced to watch for six seconds before something else plays, those can be very effective as well, especially in terms of reaching a lot of people and, and driving that message home pretty frequently. 15 and 30 seconds, those tend to be the skippable ones. So you maybe watch for six seconds and then you decide to skip or not beauty about those is, you know, if you choose to skip, you know, a business doesn't pay for that, right? That's kind of a free impression, right? Someone chose to skip, you, you might have actually impacted that person. They might actually search about that brand later, but you didn't actually pay for that because that person chose to skip. So I would say six seconds, 50 seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, those are kind of the key formats. And then we have kind of different bidding strategies that allow us to have different strategies, whether it's is our key Thing to drive sales? Is it to drive new visitors to the website? Is it to reach as many people as possible? Um, we kind of have different ways to go about that depending on the goals. So the formats, certainly we have quite a few different formats. So I'd say main ones are six seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds. I'd say some of the bid strategies and approaches and tactics you can use really allow you to customize it. And now I'd say one of the most powerful ways that you can target is something that we call custom intent which is taking what people search on Google and YouTube, right? The two biggest search engines 
and then targeting them on YouTube. So if you're searching for, you know, red shoes, I'll give that example again. If you're typing that into Google search, if we're selling red shoes, can we show someone a video of red shoes that highlights how they're different from other people? Someone who we know has been searching about red shoes, you know, they're in market, right? Kind of this idea that this person is likely to buy red shoes in the near future. We can reach that moment, that person on YouTube in that moment based on what they search on Google. So I would say, you know, the targeting is, is and the, the bid strategies is some of the ways that you can really customize it and get unique to kind of what the goals are for each customer. a little bit more on bid strategy beyond just YouTube, but across um, search and, and any other area that people are looking to advertise on Google. Um, what are the best bid strategies specifically for this time of year for Black Friday, Cyber Monday? How should a brand think about pacing and spreading out their spend across um, Black Friday, Cyber Monday? And we'll get into a minute what more people are talking about is Cyber Week. Um, so what's the best way to ensure they're pacing correctly and that there's, you know, especially if they're a smaller, newer brand and maybe perhaps have a more limited budget, what days should they focus on? Yeah, great question. Maybe I'll, I'll just, a few questions in there. Maybe I'll, I'll answer and then throw it over to Yoav here. In terms of, in terms of bid strategies, you know, it, it does depend on a lot of situations. I'd say a lot of e-commerce companies, um, we work with a lot of e-commerce companies at Hawk. A lot of those companies, uh, they use ROAS bid strategies, what is return on ad spend. And so what we're really doing is we're kind of telling the system what return on ad spend do we want? And then the system hopefully goes out and, and gets that return on ad spend. Now, I think sometimes companies set that too high and they limit their volume and they kind of miss out. But I would say ROAS is probably one of the most impactful. Um, maximized conversion values is something similar. On the search side, I think maximized conversion is something that works pretty well. But I think all of these are dependent on understanding what are the goals of the business and how do we set these targets appropriately? Because these targets, will, whatever you set for that could really influence your results in a, in a much more significant way than a lot of people realize. So I'd say, you know, ROAS is probably the most popular on e -com, but it's also easily manipulated in ways that don't necessarily help a business in a lot of ways. I would say in terms of budgeting, in terms of thinking about, yeah, how do we even think about Q4? Like it's a, it's a crazy time. How do we even know? I mean, I, we have some data that kind of backs up when we expect kind of really high volume times. I think two weeks before Black Friday and Cyber Monday and two weeks afterwards, that four week period is really, really elevated. And I think we saw that in the last presentation as well with some of the Facebook data. I think our data says a lot of similar things. It's that four week period. It's not just the Black Friday, Cyber Monday thing. It's more of a four week period. You know, two weeks before Black Friday, Cyber Monday, two weeks afterwards kind of leading up to Christmas holidays. This four week period will be the highest volume of purchases of searches of, of e-commerce activity that there will be for the year by far by far so i'd say if you're really narrowing in on a four week time period where you don't want your budget to be capped and you want to take advantage of the opportunity it's those four weeks and then i think between now and then actually is actually a good time to think about how can we maybe get more cheap traffic to the website how can we get a lot of people that maybe we can retarget in that time period because it's going to be a little bit more expensive um, so yeah, that's a little bit. I'll throw it over to you. Yoav. I'm sure Yoav's got some thoughts here as well. Yeah, no, I think that's all, that's all spot on, right? It's thinking about how can we get consumers into the funnel now when it's a little bit cheaper, retarget them, um, during the holiday season where they're actually ready to buy. If we think about specific dates, right. That are going to spike. I mean, it's no longer, uh, a one day, two day. Black Friday, Cyber Monday, like there is a whole calendar that that's on Google's website um, using kind of credit card data, Google data, and a couple other data sources that shows when are certain spikes for different um, categories expected. And so those are really helpful if we want to look at specific tools. There's Performance Planner um, that now includes shopping, search, et cetera, um, where people, you know, brands can say, these are our goals 
and then being able to forecast performance over a period of time based on that. And so honestly, I think a, a, a number of the platforms, whether it's Facebook, Google, et cetera, have made it increasingly simple and easy for brands to be able to um, you know, forecast performance over a period of time. And it's important just that brands start early and they think about the full funnel. Um, Cause as Gary mentioned, it's a lot cheaper to get someone's email address today than it will be in four weeks. And so brands that are able to start early are the brands that are going to end up winning. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more. That was going to be one of my next questions is how soon should a brand prepare? And obviously we've heard from Gary that four week period is sort of crunch time. Um, but to both of your points, I mean, competition is just going to increase as things heat up across the board. And the trends we've seen the past couple of years, right? It started and it was really just Black Friday. And then, you know, things kept growing and suddenly Cyber Monday became a thing. And then it was always Black Friday and Cyber Monday. And then this year, especially in light of the pandemic, we've seen that a lot of these big box retailers have actually gone ahead and sort of canceled their doorbuster deals in person. So a lot of them are also moving online. Um, and it seems like Cyber Monday is really expanding sort of into this whole Cyber Week situation that we've also seen in, in previous years, although people didn't perhaps uh, think of it or speak about it that way. Um, given this increased competition that we're, we're going to see perhaps this year more than ever, are there is there a sort of baseline extra percentage that brands should set aside or an incremental increase that they should think about um, this year more than ever over previous years? What is the general ballpark that is a good amount for brands to think about spending percentage wise of their, of their budget this time of year versus any other time of year? And, and if we think about spend, right, there's spend on the creative piece and then there's spend on the distribution piece. And so I think, brands need to put a lot of thought into what is the story they're trying to tell. So if they hit a consumer the first time, what is that story? How is that different than the second time, the third time? If they're giving a second, seven second ad or a 15 second ad or a 30 second ad to a consumer, like what does the consumer want to see the first time versus the second time they interact with the brand? Um, how can they best tell their brand's story so that it's more than just a product, but they're able to really resonate with, with different consumers. I know, you know, now whenever I search for any product, there's a baby in it because I have a baby. And brands that are able to do that um, are the ones that are going to end up winning. And so I really don't think there's, you know, I, I th there's a lot of information around where competition is going to go across the different verticals and um, honestly, some are up, some are down. Um, so sometimes it's going to be cheaper, but regardless, I think it's important to really think about what is your return on ad spend? What does that look like across your different segments? Which customer do you really want to acquire? And then be extremely smart about how you do that. And one way to do that is integrated with your CRM data, right? So that, you know, this is who I advertise to, but then this is the actual purchase that is in our system, this is how much that purchase is for. And I think without linking some of those pipes, you're kind of just spending money and hoping for the best, um, which is not a good strategy. So in my mind, instead of really just thinking through like what percentage increase do we need to do this year versus next year, I would really think about that whole experience and how can you acquire the most profitable customers? And then how can you get them kind of further engaged with your brand? Definitely. So we've had a lot of questions come in from the audience. So I wanna to get to some of those now so that we have enough time hopefully to get to all of them. One of the first questions is, how can a brand new business compete on Google Ads? Yeah, I mean, right I think, so Google, Google is very profitable for a lot of companies. Um, Google advertising is a very effective type of advertising. I think 
there are a lot of companies that are very, very successful. I think on, you know, Google has millions and millions of customers, you know, on average, I, I want to say when this study was done a few years ago, the average company gets at least $2 out for every dollar that they put in, right? So I think from a macroeconomic perspective, uh, Google influences hundreds of billions of dollars every year. And the reason is because, you know, they're, they're helpful. They, they help advertisers connect with the right people at the right time, at the right moment. And I think, you know, if you want to be really competitive, leverage expertise, leverage agencies like Hawk Media. You know, the, Hawk Media works with, I mean, I don't, how many clients have you guys worked with over the last few years? I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands, who knows? Yeah, we probably can't even, wouldn't even want to spend time trying to count it, right? And so I think what you can do is you can learn from other businesses what's worked well, what hasn't, you know, if certain business comes into Hulk Media, it's like, well, what, what, um, what vertical are you? Are you in e-commerce? You're in lead generation. If you're in e-commerce, like what's specifically about e-commerce? You, are you in the, you know, the plant industry? Oh, we, we've got some clients who have been in that space. So I think we can always learn from success from other companies because there's a lot of success stories from a lot of companies out there who have made a lot of money on Google and we can really learn from that and leverage it. So I think, uh, yeah, sometimes it can, Google might seem sometimes expensive uh, from an outside perspective, I've heard that before, but you know, when you figure it out, you make it work and it starts making money for you, then you can scale that. And Google is oftentimes very uniquely positioned to double, triple, quadruple sales. You know, we have pl over nine platforms that have over a billion users. Once you make it work, it can really, really work. Awesome. So we have another question from the crowd. I know we've talked quite a little bit about ROAS, return on ad spend, but the question is, what are the top metrics to look at during your very first campaign? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question, right? I guess if you're running your first campaign, I mean, the question is like, what's the business goal? Like, what, what, are they, what are they hoping to accomplish? What stage of the business cycle are they in, right? If maybe if they're running their first campaign, maybe they're a startup where they just need to make people aware of who they are, right? That's the first step, right? Maybe brand awareness, maybe the total amount of impressions and clicks to the website is, is something that's really important. Maybe they've kind of evolved from that stage and, you know, they're really more focused on sales, right? And then it's really... What's our revenue that we're driving? What is our return on ad spend? You know, sometimes it's a combination. Maybe, you know, you have certain products you want to drive sales and revenue is really the focus. Maybe you have, you're launching a new product and brand awareness is, is the focus. You know, maybe a lot of companies as they get larger, you know, especially when you think about TV buys, they think about reach and frequency. You could, you could be running your first campaign on Google. Or you've been spending on TV forever. Right. And, and what you care about on TV is how many people can you reach and how frequently can you deliver that message? And so maybe on YouTube, we should just be thinking about reach and frequency the same way we do other things. So I think it depends on what is what is the goal? What is the what is the business objective? What is the marketing objective? And then once we know that and understand that, we can then come back and say, hey, these are some of the metrics that we think are important because it's it's not so simple where it's like, yeah, like you put a dollar in and someone buys something immediately. So oftentimes, you know, someone clicks on it, they go to the website, they do a little research, they look at some other people, they watch a bunch of videos, they come back to the website, they're still intrigued with, you know, they add to cart, but oh, they're not quite ready to check out. So they go somewhere else, you know? So it's, you know, I, I think it's, it's about kind of figuring out what stage of company, what stage of growth are you in? What is your biggest focus right now? And then working together with your agency partners, with us, with Google, because, you know, that's a big focus of ours too, is trying to understand like, what is that business objective? And then how can we help you think about what should be the key metrics? Good. Well, did you have something to add? Yeah, I was going to say, and there's metric, there's solutions for each, right? So if you want brand awareness, there's solutions there. If you want actions like within YouTube now, within the video, you can go and you can get a customer's email address, um, physical address, et cetera, right? With just a couple of clicks directly without leaving the video. And that's called true view for action um, with custom intent with a form fill. So it's called true view for action form fill. And so 
it really depends on what the goals are for that given channel. And we talked about kind of the funnel before, but if what you want is to acquire email addresses, that's one strategy. And you should look at that strategy across search display and video across both Google and Facebook, right? Um, and maybe other platforms as well, but really thinking through kind of what is the customer journey? Where are they um, along that customer journey? And how do you want to reach them? Um, I, I think it's really going to change what your goals are for a given campaign. A lot of times we see brands come in and kind of think that they know what, um, what their objectives are. And just through a little bit of discussion around, you know, like what has worked historically as well as which specific customers um, end up coming back, that has changed and that shifts the strategy. So I think having those conversations and having kind of a thought partner to, um, to discuss that with is really helpful. Awesome. So we've had two questions come in from the crowd specifically about testing. The first one is, if you're launching a last minute holiday campaign, should you risk not testing? Should you risk not testing? I guess what I guess I'm a little confused by the question, like testing in in what context, I guess. I'm assuming it's a crowd question, so I'm not sure, but I'm assuming they mean perhaps gotcha. A B testing or copy or creative assets. The other related question that we got from the crowd on testing was what is a good length of time to test campaigns, especially when the window for holiday shopping may be shorter? So perhaps once you've set it up, you've launched it before you change anything based off the data and insights that you're, the feedback you're kind of getting on performance. Gotcha. Okay. So I guess I'll take a step back. We think about what are some parameters we want to think about testing on Google in general, right? I'd say one thing that's important to think about with machine learning is what we typically look at is the first two weeks we typically classify as a learning curve, right? The, the system's trying to learn. I would say you really want to only be starting to analyze data and starting to compare kind of statistical significance after about a four week time period. So what that does mean is that we are running kind of right into that time period where it's like, not sure we're really gonna be able to get a full data set to be able to analyze. Um, so, I mean, at the same time, like if your question is, should I test spending on Google or not? I would say absolutely yes. We could tell you if you're gonna if you're gonna make money or not. You you put money in, you know, are you selling products? Are we able to help drive sales for you? Are we able to help drive leads for you? So if the question is, is now a time to start testing spending on Google when we've never done it before? Yes, because we can probably very quickly tell how well it's doing. If the question is more, you know, we want to A B test different kind of ad text copy, different video creative um i would say you know it's there's always times for testing i would say if it's a strategy that's really tied to black friday cyber monday now is probably around the last time you want to be doing some of this testing probably any later than this you know it's probably not going to be that great i mean as, especially as we get into that four week time period two weeks before two weeks afterwards that's not going to be normal data right it's not going to be data that we're used to that we can say this is a base level to compare to so i think for our strategies for black friday cyber monday we, we do want to be pretty down packed with kind of what that strategy is but if it is a question of should i test spending on google before the holidays and i've never spent it all absolutely because i think very quickly you could probably see is this is this a channel that could be could be good for you or not. Sometimes it does take time and Google does get better over time. Machine learning, the algorithms help make it better. But, you know, sometimes it works very quickly, so. Awesome. And one other thing I think with A-B testing is with machine learning, like that's what Google does. So the machine learning will test different creative, different bids. So if a brand is advertising to Ashley, me and Gary, we will each get a slightly different ad um, and the price will be different. So the price that that brand pays to get in front of me versus Ashley versus Gary will vary based on 
who we are, how likely we are to purchase, what device we're using. We look at, I think it's 80 million signals um, before serving an ad and determining the price. So um, I think A-B testing used to be a very manual process, but now with machine learning, um, that's what these platforms do kind of on behalf of the game. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a great, that's a, sorry, just to add to that. I mean, really what we can do there is instead of necessarily doing like a split A, B test, we can say, well, let's maybe add some more variables. Let's add more creative. Let's, let's allow the system to figure out in each given situation, what might be the best one to pull. So there's almost like A, B testing always going on. Awesome. We only have a minute left. So just one last question. Is there a minimum buy-in Sorry, you cut out there. I didn't quite hear that. What was the question? There is buy-in minimum for performance planner. Is there a buy-in minimum? So to be able to use the tool? Yes. Uh, no. Um, typically, it is based on historical data. So if you have more historical data, it's, it's going to be more accurate. But there's no, there's no minimum. Great. I think that's all the time we have today. Sorry, someone else was crying on my end to be picked up, so it's mutual. Um, but thank you so much, Yoav and Gary, for joining us today. Um, the only other question we had was if, um, Yoav, you had mentioned earlier that Google has a similar presentation to the one Facebook gave today. Um, and if you have anything you can share with us similarly um, with the group. Um, so perhaps you can hop into Slack after a presentation if you do and, and share that with everyone. But um, thank you both so much for your time. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us.